My name is Ray Dronowski. I'm the chair of the Holyoke Democratic City Committee and a member of the Massachusetts Democratic State Committee. I want to welcome you all here on behalf of our organizations who put this together. Um, it was a, a, a great uh, collaboration between the local um, Democratic and town city committees. If anyone here uh, needs interpretation uh, f uh, for hearing, there's a section here in the front, and we invite you to come down and sit right here. It's roped off for you. We have interpreters here on my left. Please uh, just come right down. Our forum tonight is going to be uh, taped. I'm not sure if it's broadcast live on NCTV, but it will be uh, available there. I want to welcome also our many elected officials who are here tonight from the area. Uh, I'm not going to single them out because then I'll forget somebody, and that's never a good idea. I do want to thank uh, especially our panelists who are with us uh, and our moderator. Uh, we greatly appreciate your generosity and your time uh, with this process that we have here tonight. I uh, also want to thank the many individuals who submitted questions in advance of tonight's forum. You will hear them um, presented to the candidates as well. In addition to the individuals who uh, submitted questions, we received questions from local nonprofit organizations, including the Amherst Survival Center, the Care Center, Casa Latina, CESA, the Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture, Climate Action Now, the Food Bank of Western Mass, Highland Valley Elder Services, the Northampton Survival Center, Stavros, and the United Way. Just want to make you aware uh, of Senator Warren's having collect uh, signature collections this weekend in Springfield and Greenfield. If you are interested in that, there's more information on her Facebook page and her website. Uh, also of note in the program, there's many different activities happening in our cities and towns in the next few weeks, and they're all listed in the program. Of particular note, um, and there's also an insert, is our upcoming Take Back the House Summit, which will take place on Saturday, April 7th at 1 o'clock at Smith Vocational and Agricultural, Agricultural High School here in Northampton. The governor's race this year is extremely important to our work. We must focus on the issues and point to the facts of what has been happening or perhaps not happening under the Baker administration. All three of our candidates tonight are outstanding examples of why we must elect a Democratic governor this fall. Together, the, together with the work we must do on behalf of electing Senator Elizabeth Warren, our Democratic constitutional officers, our state senators, our state representatives, we are in an exciting time here in Massachusetts and certainly around the country. In addition to that, you will learn at the Take Back the House Summit that there's a lot of races we can help that are out of state, um, that we can help to flip the house to blue this fall. So I think I got all my announcements in. Thank you all for coming again and I'd like to uh, <laughs> welcome and introduce our moderator, Claire Higgins. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me now? If I practically have the mic right against my nose, you can hear me. Good. Um, so welcome. I'm really glad you're all here. It looks like we're probably pushing. Now I have to stay stock still with my mouth right in front of the mic. No. I'm going to borrow one of the mics. We'll figure out how to make this work. Um, so thanks, everybody, for being here. I think we're probably over 250, maybe even closer to 300 people. So um, and while, while there's a lot of politicians in the room, and I know who you all are, there's even, and, and some wannabe politicians, there, there are even more people who are the grassroots people who get out and make things happen, make, make elections happen. And democracy about is, is about all of us doing the work. So I, I'm really happy with this panel that we have here. I just want to um, introduce them, and then the candidates will we'll let them introduce themselves as we launch right into what we're doing today. So first, Natalia Munoz is here. Um, 
Natalia is a Puerto Rican multimedia journalist who hosts a bilingual program on arts, culture, media, and politics in Viacom Munoz on WHMP 1400 AM Talk Radio. Uh, Stan Moulton of the uh, Daily Hampshire Gazette is here. He is the uh, he was a reporter, has been a reporter and editor for 42 years at the Gazette in Northampton, where he's now the opinion editor. He's a graduate of H Hampshire College in Amherst, and he has been covering politics in the Valley since the 1970s. He's really the dean on the, on the, at the desk tonight. So <laughs> congratulations. We're glad you're here. Um, Jennifer Taub is fr from Northampton, is a professor at Vermont Law School, where she teaches business law courses, including contracts, corporations, securities regulation, and white collar crime. Not how to do it, but what it is. <laughs> Although I suppose you could learn it from the class. Uh, she's a co-founder of the National, National Tax March in 2017, and offers legal commentary for various print, digital, and televised media outlets. And then finally, uh, Ikari Njiri, who wakes us all up every morning, is here. He's a news afternoon. reporter. Afternoon. Afternoon. No, you're in the afternoon. Well, I sleep late, evidently. <laughs> That's right, it's the afternoon. Um, is a news reporter and music producer on New England Public Radio, WFCR. WFCR wakes us all up. The NPR affiliate in Amherst and Springfield. In his, in his news role, he's the primary local host for NPR's daily magazine, All Things Considered. And as music producer, he's the host of Jazz Safari that's heard on Saturday nights. This is a really great panel, and I'm really glad they all agreed to be here. Um, if you don't know who these people are by now, you probably w thought you were going to see a musical or something. So I'm not going to I'm not going to introduce them. Their bios are in the book, and we're going to start with um, opening statements as soon as I find the tiny slip of paper that tells me the order. <laughs> but I think we're starting with SETI. So uh, um, the, uh, the mayor is going to come up and speak. She told me not to call her mayor, but That's right. <laughs> I can still call. Give her a round of applause. Please. Look, I'm a lifelong public servant, two-term mayor of my hometown, Newton, Massachusetts, third-generation combat veteran. I got into this race because of the defining issue of our time, economic inequality. And me and Charlie Baker have a very clear difference about how to address economic inequality here in our Commonwealth. Yes, I embrace many of the policies that you do and folks on the stage, $15 minimum wage, paid family leave, single-payer health care. We've got to get those in place now. But I also believe we got to ask people who are doing really well in this economy to contribute more, starting with folks making a million dollars a year or more to invest in critical areas here in the Commonwealth. Three areas I want to go through. Education. Right now, we are underfunding public education. Chapter 70 is outdated. We've got to ask folks who are doing really well so that we can fully fund K through 12, add after school enrichment, summer enrichment, early childhood, and I believe in free public college lifelong with apprenticeships included. We've all sat in gridlock traffic across the Commonwealth, right? You've all driven over roads and bridges and sidewalks that are falling apart. That's because of lack of investment. Charlie Baker believes in privatization and no new revenue. It's wrong. We gotta ask folks who are doing really well to pay more so that we can invest in the Pioneer Valley Regional Transit Authority, not gut it, expand it, and north-south, as your mayor, north-south rail, in addition to east-west rail, right? That's what we have to invest and in, get these cars off the roadway and ensure people get to where they need to go. Opioid addiction, finally. 7,000 people have died of opioid addiction since 2014 in the state of Massachusetts. Over five people a day are dying of opioid addiction. 70 people a day are becoming addicted. We have got to invest in treatment. We need more beds. We need more clinicians. We need community-based lifelong treatment. It's going to take asking people doing really well to contribute more so that we can invest in dealing with this epidemic and treating our fellow human being. That's what my campaign's all about. We have to do better, we must do better, and we've got to tell the truth about it. I ask for your support. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. 
I'm Bob Massey. I'm running for governor because I am a lifelong social justice environmental activist who is a fiery advocate for change, which I think we need today. There are problems in this state that the governor is ignoring the, uh, the four basic elements of a decent life, a good home, a good school, a good doctor, a good job. We need to be fighting so that people have access, that they have uh, more access to rental housing, they have access to uh, purchasing housing. We need to make sure that students are available to have a 21st century economy all the way through higher education. Uh, we need to fight so that everyone is for single payer. I come from uh, a history of having uh, my own severe medical problems that I've come through, but I know more than anyone how important it is to have uh, medical care and we need to fight for better jobs, that jobs in this state suck, and that most young people do not have access to uh, decent jobs. Um, we also need a governor who can look into the future. We have problems coming at us that need leadership. Number one is climate change, on which I have worked for 25 years. <laughs> Another one is moving rapidly to renewable, 100% renewable energy. Another one is that we need a statewide modern transportation system that will build the economy of the entire state. And finally, we need to be prepared for problems that we're not even fully aware of, such as artificial intelligence, which is rapidly threatening the jobs that we are trying to prepare our young people for. Those driverless cars do not have drivers, and there are many other areas that we need to be prepared for. More than anything, I want to ignite a renewal of creativity, of boldness, of the ability to dream, because this state has always been a leader, and right now we are not only not leading, we are falling behind. And I'd like to pledge to you that as your governor, not only would I lead, I would ask you to lead because we are ready for change. Thank you very much. Good evening. Jay Gonzalez. I'm running for governor because I care about people and I want to make a difference in people's lives. With Trump taking us backwards every single day, it is more important than ever that we are leading right here in Massachusetts. But we're not leading under Governor Baker. He's a status quo, wait and see governor. And it's not good enough. It's not good enough to simply accept the world the way it exists and try to manage it better. We need a governor who's going to see the way the world should be and take us to that place. Let's aim high. Let's aim high, Democrats. As your governor, I will fight for a living wage, paid family leave, affordable housing, debt-free college. I will work to ensure that every single child and family in this state has access to high-quality, affordable child care and preschool. A, a transportation system across this entire state that people can actually depend on to get to work on time. A single-payer health care system that's simpler, cheaper, and does a better job keeping people healthy. This is a former health insurance CEO telling you we need to get rid of health insurance companies. And as the only, as the only candidate in this race with experience working in the health care industry, I will get it done. I'll take on other big challenges we face, like climate change and the opioid epidemic and our broken criminal justice system. And most important, most important, I will stand up for every single person in this state. I'm offering an ambitious agenda to move us forward and the leadership experience to deliver on it. And I'm asking for your help. Join our team. Put a bumper sticker on your car. Knock on some doors. Tell your friends about this campaign. Because with your help, I am 100% confident that we will win back the governor's office, we will aim high, we will make Massachusetts a leader again, and we will make a meaningful difference in people's lives. Thank you very much. They're bringing me my very own microphone. I'm very happy. <laughs> yeah, we'll try this. Um, we're going to start uh, with the questions from our, our journalist friends, and then I have some questions later that were posed by the audience. If they hit them all, then we're done for the night, but I'm pretty sure they won't. So we're, we're going to start with Stan Moulton. 
Thanks, Claire. Uh, all three of you identified some shortcomings you see in the Baker administration, yet uh, polls uh, have consistently shown that he has a very large approval rating in, among Massachusetts voters. In fact, last year's 75% approval rating was the highest of any sitting governor in the, in the country. What, what makes you feel, uh, if you win the September primary, that he'll be vulnerable to your candidacy? It's easy to be popular when you don't do anything and you never take a stand and your whole approach to the job is being cautious. The most recent poll that came out actually asked people whether they think he's doing a good job on a whole series of issues, a long list, and there wasn't one area where a majority of people thought Charlie Baker's doing a good job. If you ask people, why do you like Charlie Baker, it's never, he's doing a great job fixing our transportation system or some other issue that affects people's lives. It's always, he seems nice, and I'm really glad he isn't a crazy Republican like exists in other parts of the country. <laughs> when did the measure of whether our governor's doing a good job become that he's nice and isn't crazy? I am, I am 100% confident. There is gonna be a huge Democratic turnout in this election. All that blue wave, the energy in this party that we all see everywhere we go and we see tonight, Democrats are going to turn out. As long as they're informed about the choice in this election, which I sum up as uh, a governor who's maybe nice, not crazy, and doing a terrible job versus someone who's also nice, not crazy, and will actually make a difference in people's lives, we will win. It's embarrassing how often this single poll is used as a, uh, as a weapon when, as I think all of my colleagues here, we have been all over the state. I've been in more than 250 communities, and everywhere I go, I hear that people are ready for change. They are ready to see uh, a governor who is willing to tackle the core problems. Um, one of the most important things uh, that we see today is the need to take on deep structural problems. This is not that we have an isolated issue, an isolated over uh, problem over here. We have an economy that is upside down and broken and a capitalism that is upside down and broken. And we need to fix that system. But I just want to say, that blue wave that we're seeing, we've seen winds in Virginia, New Jersey, Missouri, uh, Wisconsin, rural Pennsylvania, and even Alabama. And what I'm telling you is that if a Democrat can win in Alabama, a Democrat can win in Massachusetts. So Governor Baker, Mike, Mike, yeah. Where's the microphone from? Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Massey. Um, Governor Baker put out a press release last November announcing his reelection, and there were three areas he said he was successful on that he's going to run on. One was transportation. <laughs> you can laugh. The second, a little bit more serious, is his work in uh, the area of the opioid epidemic, which we know has gotten worse. And the third is his pride of holding the line on no new revenue. This was his press release. This is what he's running on, folks. As was mentioned um, a little earlier, when you look at the polling, uh, that WBRR did on every issue that people care about. Transportation, he's failing. This is what people are asking. Opioids, he's failing, because people know other people who are struggling with opioids, lost someone with opioids. Education, he's failing. Cost of healthcare, failure. What we gotta do is something Deval Patrick used to say all the time. Democrats need to grow a backbone and tell the truth about what it's gonna take to solve these difficult issues, and I'm telling you, when we look people in the eye and not only say we need single payer and we need paid family need, but we look people in the eye and say, we're gonna ask people to pay more to invest in these things, particularly around greater Boston area. So we can get our economy back on track and make sure we deal with economic inequality. We organize like heck on the ground, we get high turnout and we win. That's how we're gonna win in November.
this is my god okay yeah. if you if our candidate friends are struggling to see the color uh, i think this gentleman is perfectly willing to jump up and down and wave his hand <laughs> we're trying to be subtle so okay. this question is for one of <coughs> this question is for all of you. The, the Springfield mayor, Mayor Sarno, is pushing. <laughs> 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 the Springfield mayor Sarno is pushing hard against the notion of sanctuary cities. He's even trying to shut down a church that is a sanctuary for people who do not have a legal status to be in this country. What I'd like to know is what your posi position is on sanctuary cities and how would you handle this current debate with him to try to change his mind? Well, I support uh, Safe Communities Act. I support sanctuary cities. Back in 1982, I was actually ordained in the Episcopal Church. I am very proud of those religious communities that have stepped up and demonstrated the kind of core values that I believe are at the heart of Massachusetts. I was just reading about a, a church in Amherst that is supporting uh, a family, and I'm very proud of that. I'm also proud that my own church in, uh, at St. James uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts is doing the same thing. So this is, right now, we are facing challenge after challenge that goes to the heart of who we are as a people and what our values are. This is a nation built on immigrants. We have proudly welcomed people for generations. We now have a vicious, cruel president who doesn't understand core American values, and we need to fight that every step of the way. So I would support uh, not only passing the Safe Communities Act, but I believe that when people have an honest, deep conversation, as has happened, we are able to get over our fears and return to our welcoming and inclusive values that are the heart of who we are as a nation. That's still out. After Donald Trump got elected, members of my Democratic Town Committee and City Council came to me and asked me to put an ordinance in place that reflected Welcoming City Safe Communities Act. I work with the police department, I work with people in my community, and we passed in Newton um, a welcoming cities ordinance, which I was very proud of, with 19 city councilors. And it took a lot of work to get there. Look, we've got to say, pass the Safe Communities Act on Beacon Hill. And if I were the governor, I would be convening town administrators, mayors, city councilors, police chiefs, working with them to ensure that they understand this makes us more safe and not less safe. Furthermore, I would actually go back to the Deval Patrick administrative order of not have, having our state police active as ICE agents. One of the first acts that Charlie Baker did was rescind that order that Deval Patrick put in place. I'd make sure that that's in place as well. The first piece of legislation I supported as a candidate for governor was the Safe Communities Act. But we need more than laws. We need public leaders who are gonna stand up for people. I actually, Natalia, before coming here, came directly from the South Congregational Church in Springfield, where Gisela is, be is being held in sanctuary, or is staying in sanctuary because Donald Trump is trying to deport her. And what Mayor Sarno is doing to threaten this church is outrageous. It is outrageous. We need, this is a woman who's been in this country from Peru for 17 years, is married here to an American citizen, has two children here who are American citizens, works here uh, under a work permit, pays her taxes, is a law-abiding resident of the Springfield community. It is outrageous that Donald Trump is trying to deport her, and it is outrageous that Mayor Sarno is trying to help him do it. And I want you to know, we need leaders in this state who see people like Gisela, hear them, will stand up for them, see them for who they are, human beings, human beings. And if I'm your governor, you can count on the fact that I will stand up for G Gisela and every single person in this state. The 
regional transit authorities have, have been facing significant uh, shortfalls in funding. Here in Western Massachusetts, the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority is considering cutting some routes, eliminating others altogether, increasing fares, and overall just reducing access to public transportation. Uh, for individuals and families who rely on public transportation to get to work, to get to the supermarket, to get to the food pantry or clinic, reduced service that costs more creates additional challenges for them to meet the daily demands of their lives. Unlike the MBTA, which, which gets its own budget line item, the PBTA and other regional uh, authorities are lumped into one, which has led to complaints of unequal treatment and funding. What will you do to support regional public transit, and in particular the PVTA and bus routes within this county and those routes that connect the four counties of, of the Pioneer Valley? Someone? And that's a directed to, to all candidates, please. So, do I start and then back down? <clears throat> One of the things you should uh, salute your mayor, Narkowitz, is he's been a real champion uh, for fighting for funding for the Pioneer Valley Regional Transit Authority. I am, I've talked to the mayor, Narkowitz, about this a lot. Um, I'm proud to have his support in this race. But in addition to that, here's what I understand. The regional transit authorities can no longer afford to have a governor that guts them, that it depends on them or asks them essentially to rake, uh, raise the fares for people and decrease service. This is a death spiral for public transportation here in this area of the state. What would I do? I would, again, be honest about tax revenue. We've gotta go beyond the millionaire's tax and we've gotta ask people, particularly in and around the greater Boston area, to contribute more so that we can not only uh, fully fund what's happening now with the regional uh, uh, Pioneer Regional Transit Authority, but we expand the service. We know in transportation, if you provide good, accessible transportation, you increase it, people will use it. If it's not accessible and, and the uh, fares are high, people will not use it. So my commitment is to expand the service, uh, to understand exactly where people need to go here in the region, um, and fund it, and not be afraid to ask people uh, to pay more in taxes who are doing really well in our economy, particularly around Greater Boston. So we have to sneak our biographies into these very short answers. Um, I mentioned that I was in ministry, but because I was so committed to economic justice, I uh, eventually did a doctorate at Harvard Business School uh, in order to be a more effective advocate. And uh, there are a couple things we need to say. First of all, uh, I was in Worcester a, f a few days ago where they're also cutting the RTA, and I met with the people who were there to protest it, and I'll tell you, you look into their eyes, you see handicapped people, you see homeless people, this is their lifeline, and he's considering cutting many critical routes. Um, it's also, uh, part of a much larger problem. I put out a 40-page plan, not just to solve this problem, but to put before the entire population a 10-year plan to solve this. Now, you have to ask, being from a business background, having business training, what would it gain us if we did it? What will it cost us if we don't do it? We need to have an advocate in the governor for a statewide a conversation where we commit to a path over 10 years that gets us what we really want, which is not only an advanced RTA supporting, but a statewide system that matches those of the modern economies around the world, which we have neglected for too long, and which has damaged Western Massachusetts more than any other community. You know, we, we often describe Governor Baker as a status quo governor because he doesn't do anything. This is an area where we're, our transportation system and his failures in this area are actually dragging Massachusetts backwards. US News and World Report w rated Massachusetts the best state in the country a year ago. They just downgraded us to eighth. One of the big reasons why is because our transportation system is one of the worst in the country and is getting worse and worse. Um, these guys are right, one of the fundamental things, this isn't complicated, we need to invest more in our, in our roads, bridges, transit authorities across this state, and, uh, and our entire transportation system, let alone pursue some of the transformational investments that will make a meaningful difference in people's lives and, and help in, ensure economic growth. Our economies, our regional economies, depend on the regional transit authorities, uh, on our roads and bridges. 
it affects people's quality of life in a very real way. Uh, I know the Pioneer um, uh, Valley Transit Authority. I used to work as outside counsel to it when I worked at Palmer and Dodge when I was secretary of ANF. We actually made, for Governor Patrick, we actually made progress in forward funding the transit authorities across the state and making other progress as governor. This will be a priority of mine and I will be like a dog with a bone on this issue. So, uh, speaking of transportation, I have a follow-up question. Um, many people out here in western Massachusetts are very interested in high-speed rail connecting Springfield to Boston. And all of the candidates so far, and this is a question for all of you, have talked about supporting a modern transportation system. And so, I'm wondering um, whether you support uh, high-speed rail or any rail connecting Springfield to Boston, um, and if so, um, if you're aware that we can't even get a feasibility study done to look at this. And why is that? Um, well, I think this is another follow the money question. As you may know, rumor has it that a certain um, owner of a bus company um, is standing in the way. I say rumor, I don't know for sure. And so this brings me, so th this is a two-part question, really, do you support this? But also the, the sort of the sub-part is the follow the money, which is are you currently taking or planning to take any campaign donations or support from um, any bus uh, lobbyists? Um, and, and really, uh, what is your view about taking money from uh, corporate lobby corporations and other such groups in general? Um, because if you think about it, all of the things that you're standing up for, whether it is solving the opioid problem, all of this, there are folks who don't want the problem solved. So that's my question for all of you. Are you looking at Bob? Oh. I'll take it. Um, yes, I support high-speed rail from Springfield to Boston, and um, I don't think I need to worry about that particular bus company owner donating to my campaign because I've been all over him because of this very issue. Governor Baker could easily uh, agree to make this study happen. He doesn't even need a legislative appropriation. He could just have it done through the capital budget, which is what I've called on him to do. But he won't do it because he's been getting thousands of dollars from the, the family of this bus company owner, and it is a pattern with him. I, I have proposed a series of reforms to our campaign finance laws, and I have been very vocal in calling out Governor Baker every single time some big wealthy special interest gives him money and he makes a decision that is in their favor. It is why we have campaign finance laws. Uh, I will not take any corporate donations. You can't take them anyway under Massachusetts law. But I have also called for strengthening our laws so that Governor Baker can no longer um, uh, run through this Baker loophole where he's collecting these huge checks from wealthy donors, funneling them up to the National Republican Party who gives part of it to help support people like Roy Moore and then back down to the state party for his benefit. It's against the letter and spirit of our campaign finance laws and I will shut it down. Uh, I'm going to make two very quick points. Number one, this failure to advance on this is absolutely unbelievable in the face of the progress of the rest of the world. China has 12,000 miles of high-speed rail. We have zero. So we say America's in the lead. No, we're not. Japan has high-speed rail, and if the uh, transportation report is circulating, you can look and see that these, the two trains, 15 years old, they go 160 miles an hour, they could get out here in about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, in addition, I want to say, just going back briefly, Governor Baker is at cutting RTA by a lot, from 88 million to 80 million, that's a big cut. And then I want to say the bigger problem here is corporate power influencing and taking over our democracy. And I think that's a distinction uh, but among us. Because I have fought corporate power my entire career. I've fought big pharma, big oil, big banks. And uh, I've also started some of the most effective global corporate accountability organizations in the world. The Global Reporting Initiative, the Investor Network on Climate Risk. Uh, take a little while to explain them. But that is a core theme, is the overwhelming power of corporations at our federal level and excessive power in the state level and you need a governor who is willing to say it and fight it and I have the experience and the ability to do both.
So yes, I believe in East-West Rail, high-speed East-West Rail, um, 100%. And I also, as I said at the top, believe um, in North-South uh, Rail here in this region, both of, of which are incredibly important. And as the mayor's informed me, there's been a study around North-South Rail already, um, and that would really uh, produce real economic results here um, in this part of the state. Um, I think it would be fair to say that our friend from the bus company isn't going to give any of us money. Um, because of our position, but I believe in publicly financed campaigns. I think if we're really honest about um, elections, let's get, let's get all these donations out of it. I actually uh, proposed a pledge uh, for all the candidates in the race, uh, which I know these guys uh, agree with me already, uh, that we wouldn't accept any of these corporate type donations, even through loopholes. Uh, they've made their statements. Uh, Governor Baker, um, of course, never answered me or gave his answer because he's taking money through the RNC and other places and dark money. So uh, this, this, this election's about choices, whether it's uh, uh, transportation investment, asking people who are doing well to contribute more so we can build this, um, or who influences the governor's office. I think there's a clear difference. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, this is a question for all three of you, uh, specifically in reaction to, I believe I heard Mayor Warren correctly uh, when he said that he would be a leader on asking at least some residents of Massachusetts to pay higher income taxes. Uh, are all three of you willing to take that position, and what ideas specifically do you have about tax reform in Massachusetts? Tax reform. We have fought for a long time in Massachusetts to have a progressive income tax, and it has gone down repeatedly. So now what we're seeing are various ways to introduce a modified approach to the tax. The millionaire's tax or fair share tax, I completely support. Um, I oppose the uh, lowering of the uh, sales tax because of the deep cut it will make uh, in our state revenue. But we have to have a comprehensive conversation about this because you may or may not remember that we voted ourselves a tax cut a number of years ago when we lowered the income tax rate. And what that's meant effectively is that we have lost $3 billion of, uh, of revenue every year over 10 years. So if you say, why don't we have the money for our schools? Why don't we have our money for transportation? It's because we voluntarily without fully understanding the consequences, lowered uh, $30 billion to remove that. So one of the things, and this is a theme I think all of us uh, are talking about, is that a governor needs to lead in introducing difficult questions and raising them and then be willing to campaign. I really look forward to winning this race because I love campaigning and I will want to go around the state and make the case for these deep changes, including revenue increases, which realistically, we either can go backwards uh, as a state or we can go forward into the 21st century. That's a choice we must make. I think we're prepared to make it, but we need the leadership uh, to go out and lay the question squarely in front of the people. So I did something in my re-election year that a lot of people told me I was crazy to do. I put a tax override package on the ballot in March of my re-election year because I knew we had to do it. Schools, teachers, uh, infrastructure, public safety, fire stations, school buildings, uh, I won that tax package override uh, with 54% of the vote in March of my re-election year. I won my re-election with 72% of the vote. I bring that up because, and I did 70 town halls across my city to get there. We had only passed one tax override package in Newton before that had been done. I bring that up because when I think about what the state is facing, we need to have a governor that's willing to look people in the eye and say, yes, we need to raise revenue. We can't be asking cities and towns uh, to pass tax override packages uh, all across the state because that's inequitable. Newton has a strong tax base. A lot of communities can't do that. At the state level, we need to. Here's where I'd start. Donald Trump just gave a huge tax break to multinational corporations and people with extreme wealth. We need to ask those folks and those entities to contribute more so that we can make these investments and not crush middle class people, working people with tax burden, but ask those entities. People know there's a lot of wealth in this state, and it's concentrated 
So let's, let's start with that. I would, my proposals beyond the millionaire's tax, which I support, would be targeted towards those entities. And uh, we, we need to put um, everything on the table, but I'd start there. State government does not have the revenue it needs to support the level of programs and services we have today, let alone some of the investments we need to be making going forward. I support the millionaire's tax, um, asking 19,500 uh, taxpayers who are doing great in this state to pay a little bit more. That would generate meaningful new revenue, $2 billion a year that we desperately need to make investments in education and transportation. Uh, it's also a fair approach. Our tax structure in Massachusetts is regressive. Those who make the least pay the highest percentage of their income in taxes, and those who pay the most, who make the most, pay the lowest percentage. This would help rectify that a bit. I've also said a few other things. I think we should freeze the income tax for everybody else where it is today. It's at 5.1%. It's scheduled to drop down to 5%. We can't afford a further income tax cut. Uh, so I think it should be frozen. I also think, and when I was in government, um, proposed a series of reforms to actually look at all these tax breaks we give businesses and others, which cost billions of dollars a year in state tax revenue that we could be investing in other stuff that'll make a bigger difference. We never look at them, we never analyze them and assess whether they're working or not. We should. Governor Baker's ignored all those recommendations that we made. Other states took them up and are, are following these best practices. If I'm governor, we'll do it, and I'm sure we'll get some additional revenue to make some of the other investments we need. A lot of factions remain within the Democratic Party, with different sides blaming the other for not being liberal enough, for moving too slow or too fast, or being exclusive, or even for being the reason the Democrats lost the presidency. What specific steps will you take to unite the Democratic Party and unenrolled voters to assure victory this November and in 2020? So um, here's how I think about this. I um, was a, a person that came from parents um, in two tough neighborhoods in New York, uh, poor, tough neighborhoods. My dad uh, joined the military at a young age to get out of the life he was in. He uh, ended up using his GI Bill benefits to purchase the home where I grew up in Newton with my two sisters, where I live today with my wife and two children, nine and six. He used his GI Bill benefits to do that. At the end of the day, for me, this race is about addressing economic inequality and telling the truth about it. This idea that uh, you can make ends meet in this economy and sure your kids will do better than, than they did is not happening in our Commonwealth today. We need to go to our core values. Fairness, uh, investment in areas that will level the playing field, education, housing and transportation, asking people who are doing well to contribute more to pay for it, dealing with this opioid crisis, asking people to contribute more to pay for it so we can level the playing field for this generation and future generations. That's how we will unite not only our party, but our commonwealth. We have a governor right now who has not been helpful at a time where we desperately need leadership that is standing up for everyone. Uh, ordering state police to detain immigrants, opposing Syrian refugees resettling here, defending southern states flying Confederate flags at their state capitals, staying silent on transgender rights legislation. It's not okay. It's not who we are. Uh, if I'm your governor, it won't matter what color you are, what your sexual orientation is, what you believe, whether you are from Northampton or Boston or just came to this country or have a disability or are transgender. I see you. I believe in you, and as your governor, I will work for you. We have always done better when we see our differences as strengths, and when we recognize that beneath those differences are many more similarities. When we treat each other with respect and dignity and love. And that's the type of leadership I'm offering and the type of governor I'll be. Two things. First of all, in many ways, the Democratic Party is broken. I, um, 
And I say that because there are many deeply committed people in the Democratic Party, but the Democratic Party is having trouble bringing new people in and, uh, and engaging the immense amount of energy that's out there. So the Democratic Party, in order to unite it, has to be able to appeal to the unenrolled voter, to the people in, who are part of Indivisible, to the people who are part of our revolution, to the people who are part of Black Lives Matter. Those are all political movements that are rising up that are not fully being embraced. The Democratic Party has leaders who, when I ran for lieutenant governor in 1994, I met a great many wonderful people who were chairs of their local committees. They're still chairs of their local committees 24 years later. Now, that testifies to their commitment, but that is not the most dynamic way to approach the future. To bring people together, you need a bold, exciting uh, vision that people believe can happen. You need to move away from the Republican doctrine of scarcity. I'm sorry, whatever it is you want, we can't afford it. To that, an understanding that, in fact, we are in a, living in a period of greater abundance than at any other moment. We should be able to dream. We should be able to pursue the things that we want. And you don't need to be conservative or liberal or a Hib uh, Hillary person or Bernie person to share the excitement that is ignited when we believe that we can transform the future in the way that we really want to do. So laying out a bold vision, laying out a, a future based on our values is what I intend to do, what I am doing, and what people are responding to. And I believe that's the pathway, not only to unity, but also to success. Thank you. <laughs> Brevity is my specialty. <laughs> Well, going from, from notions of unity to this question, well, how would you distinguish yourself from the other candidates? And I'll ask um, Mr. Gonzalez to, to respond first. I mean, why should I vote for you and not for them? Well, I'm much taller and have more hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> uh, so let me, let me say, I've been spending a lot of good quality time with Bob Massey and Seti Warren, and they're both great human beings, and each of them would make a hell of a lot better governor than Charlie Baker. And if either one of them wins the Democratic nomination, I will have their back, and I hope you will too. Uh, but, but, <laughs> I'm asking for your support, and you know, we all have pretty, more similarities and differences in terms of what we're running on and all have an ambitious agenda and very different from Governor Baker. I'm the only candidate in this race that has leadership experience in state government getting big things done. I was Governor Patrick's Secretary of Administration and Finance, not only oversaw the state budget and a lot of other stuff, I often was his point person for negotiating a lot of the big things that we got through the legislature during that time. So I've been there, I've done it, I know how the process works, I've worked successfully through it. I think that should matter. It's not going to matter what we all want to do unless we actually do it and deliver on it. So that is the, the key uh, differentiator I'd ask you to consider. I'm also very proud of the strength of our campaign. We have a lot of momentum. I'm the only one up here who's never done this before, run for statewide office. Uh, we've got a lot of support from legislators and key activists all over this state. And uh, we have built a strong campaign. And I'm hoping every single one of you will join us after tonight and help us get even stronger. I'm going to remind everybody that we had an agreement about time that if a question was asked directly, the other two people had 30 seconds, each, uh, 45 seconds each. Just asked Jay. It was just asked of Jay. But you get to respond, yeah. And then you'll, and you'll you guys get to say why you think I'm the best one, too. It's a love fest. I have nothing bad to say about these guys either. And if either one of them win, I'll support them. Look, um, I'm the only candidate in this race that's been a lifelong public servant, served in the Clinton White House, served uh, for, with Senator Kerry in his office here in Massachusetts, ran FEMA for New England. I'm the only candidate, and I'm also a third-generation combat veteran, I'm the only candidate in this race that's been elected 
to be a chief executive. I've won three elections. My first election, my second re-election, and my election to pass that tax override. The buck stopped at my desk. We changed the way we did budgeting in Newton. I inherited a $40 million structural deficit, no rainy day fund, two of the worst conditioned school buildings in the state. Turned that around, no structural deficit. Five new schools in the next six years, three of which are done, next to being constructed now. Grew a rainy day fund to $22 million. We need a new, fresh perspective on Beacon Hill that's gonna change the way things have been operating at the state level. That's what I bring to this race, chief executive leadership that's different and new that we need uh, on our, in our state. Jay said that he's the one with experience at getting big things done. Uh, that may be true inside Massachusetts. My career has been in getting big things done at a much larger scale. Um, I was the head of a group called Ceres, which is a, brings together major pension funds and activist groups to put pressure on the biggest companies in the United States, and we were successful. I conceived of and created an entirely new system of sustainability accounting, which now drives uh, corporate behavior around the world and is required by many countries. Um, and I started the Investor Network on Climate Risk, which is an alliance of pension funds that has been pushing to move us to renewable energy for the last 15 years. Last time they met, $22 trillion were in the room. Massachusetts does not have an adequate global perspective. I believe that I have that perspective. I have the record of making deep change, and I have the record of bringing people together to get it done. So I have a question on school funding for all of the candidates. Um, is the public school funding formula broken? And if so, how would you fix it? Keeping in mind uh, regular public schools as well as charter schools. Well, yes, it is broken. Um, actually, it came into being, the foundation budget came into being in 1993, 25 years ago, um, and it really has not been changed. Now, one of the things I want to stress is that I look at things as systems, so that a, a change or an impact in one area has an impact in another. So you have to look at things holistically. And one of the problems, in addition to an inadequate commitment to education all the way through, is that, as I've heard over and over again, one of the things that is punishing our school systems is the rise in healthcare costs, is the rise in transportation costs. So in addition to providing additional funding directly uh, to and redoing the foundation budget and supporting our public universities, where I, I was at UMass Boston before I uh, ran for governor, um, we need to l go to single payer, lower medical costs, provide adequate transportation funding, and do all the interrelated things that will relieve the pressure that on uh, community budgets to then be able to provide the incremental amount uh, for schools. As a member of uh, my school committee, I sat on the school committee as mayor, I was a strong no on two. I want to make sure it, that everyone is very clear, this cynical question two was all about Charlie Baker's attempt to siphon money out of public schools into charter schools. We don't, we should not be expanding charter schools right now. What we need to do is refund, revamp chapter 70, yes, revamp chapter 70, Make sure that K through 12 funding reflects the needs of every single child in every single district of this state. It does not. It is outdated. It's based on primarily population growth. And I also believe very strongly we've got to add after school enrichment to uh, public education, summer enrichment to public education, early childhood to public education. And I believe in lifelong free public college with apprenticeships that are paid that is included. It's gonna take asking people doing really well in this economy to pay more in taxes so we can make these investments and make sure that our kids have the skill set they need to make ends meet. There are people have skill set they need to make ends meet in this economy. Uh, yes, our foundation budget's broken. The state is not living up to its constitutional obligation to provide 
the funding that school districts need to ensure that every single child in this state is getting an edu adequate education. I'd follow the recommendations of the Legislative Commission that looked into this a couple of, of years ago. Um, we are, the, f the formula is um, deficient uh, and isn't keeping up with costs in lower income districts and urban districts in particular where there are lots of English language learners, um, special education students, and others. So we need to update it and we need to invest more in it. I totally agree. More charter schools for a few more kids is not, should not be our education agenda. I also pose that ballot question. Our most important fundamental responsibility collectively through government is to ensure that every single child has access to a great public education. We cannot set up a competitive market in our public education system where there are winners and losers. There can't be losers. And right now, we're not doing nearly enough. This is a question for all three of you. Uh, March for Our Lives brought thousands of young people into the streets of uh, communities across the nation, including Northampton last Saturday. Suggest <laughs> suggesting that now may be the time to enact meaningful gun control laws. Do you support the legislation currently being considered in Massachusetts to establish extreme risk protective orders that would allow judges to temporarily remove firearms from people who are ruled dangerous to themselves or others? And beyond that, what other measures would you propose as governor to uh, reduce gun violence? As a person who carried around an M16 in Iraq for a year um, as a Navy veteran, I can tell you I strongly believe that none of these weapons belong anywhere near our schools, our neighborhoods, anywhere in civil society. All assault weapons need to be banned nationwide. This is why I joined something called Mayors Against Illegal Guns when I became mayor uh, nine years ago. It's now Every Town for Gun Safety which support that measure, as well as universal background checks, closing the gun show loophole. And I also believe we need to back Maura Healy. She, as you know, administratively <laughs> proposed closing the manufacturing loophole of, of uh, assault weapons. We need to back her on that. I organized mayors to back her. We also need to back her on her administrative order against bump stocks here in the Commonwealth. I support the extreme risk legislation. Uh, it needs to get uh, pass. I was so proud of the young people uh, that have taken a lead on this. We need to follow their lead on this. I would also say, as governor, we need to work with other governors to trace guns, where they're coming from, um, all across the country, make sure we know where they are, and ensure that we are putting strong legislation in place and using the National Governors Association as a place to put pressure on Congress to put the measures I talked about in place as well. So I, I am heartbroken and very angry about the state of our nation on this issue. Uh, when is enough enough? When is enough enough? Thank God students are standing up and getting grown-ups to pay attention to this and hold them to account. Uh, I was very disturbed to learn that the assault weapon used in Parkland was manufactured right down the road in Springfield, Massachusetts, which is why I proposed recently to ban the manufacture of assault weapons in Massachusetts. You can't buy them here. You can't buy them here. We shouldn't make them here. In the absence of action at the federal level, thanks to the stranglehold of the NRA on Donald Trump and the Republican Congress, we should be doing everything we possibly can in this state. We need leadership on this. And as a matter of principle, there should be a ban nationally on assault weapons. We should make them illegal here. I have a whole series of, of proposals to strengthen our gun laws in Massachusetts. Yes, I support the extreme risk protective order legislation I did many months ago. You can find them all on my website. But enough is enough, and we need to stand up. Uh, 
I also support uh, the extreme uh, protective orders. I also advocate for the uh, ban of manufacturing and sale to civilians of these weapons. I think one of the most effective things to push this thing through would be to require people to read what the damage done by an assault weapon bullet actually does to the human body. It is absolutely shocking. And I remember reading the account of a doctor who was trying to rescue a small child hit by assault weapon, and when he opened her up, her organ had had disappeared because it had been exploded by that weapon. These are extremely dangerous, violent weapons that get used, uh, and it's not, not just assault weapons, it's a gun problem across the board, and it's not just the case of, um, uh, of these mass murders, it's also the problem of gun violence and domestic violence, it's the problem of suicide. There are many interrelated questions here, but we need to change our culture. Just two days ago, I was with Mothers Demand Action that are doing an incredible job Job. They are fighting the uh, concealed carry export law, in other words, where we would have to respect the concealed carry rules of the worst performers. So this is a, a horrific problem. I honor the students who have been out there. It shames those of us who have not been willing to do it in the past, but today I think we may have found our moment. The Boston Globe recently ran an unusually long and forceful editorial regarding the state's energy needs, including imported Russian liquefied natural gas and opposition to pipelines. It reads in part, to build the new $27 billion gas export plant on the Arctic Ocean that now keeps the lights on in Massachusetts, Russian firms bored wells into fragile permafrost, blasted new uh, blasted a new international airport into a pristine landscape of reindeer, polar bears, and walrus, dredged the spawning grounds of the endangered uh, Siberian sturgeon in the Gulf of Ob to accommodate large ships, and commissioned a fleet of 1,000-foot ice-breaking tankers likely to kill seals and disrupt whale habitat as they shuttle cargoes of supercooled gas bound for Asia, Europe, and Everett. On the plus side, though, they didn't offend Pittsfield or Winthrop, Danvers or Groton, with even an inch of pipeline. How do you propose to balance the tension between two urgent priorities? We need reliable, affordable, and clean energy right this moment, and we need to minimize the damage to the environment right now as well. I'm restless. Um, first and foremost, we need a governor who gets the fact that climate change is the biggest threat to our planet, and we need leadership addressing this problem. I think we, we can and should accelerate our transition to renewable energy sources. That should be, first and foremost, where we go for clean, new energy. Uh, we should, despite the the condescending nature of the editorial about Pittsfield and, and pipelines in Massachusetts, I absolutely oppose the expansion, expansion of natural gas pipeline infrastructure in, in Massachusetts, which is just gonna further our dependence on fossil fuels, and in many cases is being used, we're being used as a conduit to, to send this, uh, these fossil fuels out to other countries. Um, I also think we should be the first state in the nation to adopt carbon pricing, which all the economists agree is an important economic incentive to get us to a true clean energy economy as quickly as possible. We need leadership on this. Our planet can't afford us uh, waiting on it, and we in Massachusetts can be a leader in this area if we've got a governor who's committed to do it. Okay. This editorial was the most despicable, illogical, ridiculous thing I've ever read on climate change. And I have been working on climate change for 26 years. Uh, I organized the first major event on climate change uh, in Boston, 300 people at the Museum of Science in 1992, when if I have my math correct, these guys were in high school. I have been working on it for relentlessly. I have put out a 26-page plan. We do not need any more natural gas. This is a fraud. This is a fraud 
perpetrated by our uh, utilities. These utilities do not care about us. They just want to boost their profits for their investors. Uh, they are controlled by a Department of Public Utilities appointed by this governor that are cronies of the fossil fuel agent, uh, uh, industry. Um, we could be moving towards uh, uh, wind. This governor has slowed it down. We could be moving towards solar. This governor has slowed it down. This is shocking. It's shocking in relation both to the, the planet and to our economy. This is one of the worst failures of his governorship, and I will not put up with these lies that are being perpetrated and being supported for some mysterious reason by the Boston Globe, or at least by this really ridiculous writer who has it completely upside down. When I became mayor a little over eight years ago, I understood something very clearly. If you address climate change, you can actually reduce costs and you can address social justice. A couple of things we did. We cut our carbon footprint in half as a city government, as a municipality, in the eight years since I was mayor, and we're gonna save $40 million because we went big on solar and we reduced energy consumption. We shared some of that solar power. We shared some of that solar power with 900 of our low-income residents to give them a credit on their energy bill so that they would reduce their costs. We should be investing in growing solar and growing offshore wind so we can reduce the costs for average everyday people and folks that are struggling to get by. And we should also be investing in climate change resilience, technology, and infrastructure. We just th went through several storms that have not only showed coastal flooding, but inland flooding because we don't have the infrastructure in place. So yes, we need to stop constructing these pipelines they, we do not need them. Yes, we need to invest in a carbon tax that would reinvest that in uh, making sure people can retrofit their homes and lower their costs. And yes, we can be the number one state when it comes to dealing with climate change and also uh, with economic inequality, because these uh, initiatives also create green jobs. The Trump administration has championed work requirements as a condition for receiving several kinds of public assistance. Can you please share your thoughts on this strategy and explain either your support or opposition to all three candidates, please? Um, it is a backwards proposal um, that hurt people, do nothing to ensure people have a platform to be able to take care of themselves or their family members. Um, it is backwards, it is wrong, and it's cruel. It's not who we are, it's not who, what our values are. What we should be doing is investing in, in ensuring people who can't take care of themselves have the subsidies and housing to be able to do so. And for those that can, work, we should be offering them a pathway to success. One of the programs that I found uh, to be particularly successful is run by an organization called Empath, which who work with women and children and families. Uh, women are, with heads of household with children, are the number one group of people as far as po poverty here in uh, Massachusetts. We should be investing in wraparound services, making sure that uh, uh, people who do not have the capacity to have housing, have affordable housing, do not have the capacity to get the kind of job training they need to have that job training, um, who don't, don't have proper transportation, have those in places. So I used Empath and Newton to help uh, children, families, at Newton Public Housing. It's quite successful in moving people to self-sustainability. This is the direction we need to go in, not these cruel uh, programs that do nothing uh, to help people. I think this is a good opportunity to talk about uh, two or three things that we haven't quite gotten to yet. One is that this kind of cruel approach is yet another example of the institutional racism that is part of our country and that we still have to combat. <laughs> secondly, secondly, 
Um, this is also punitive, as Seti just said. It is punitive for women, poor women, who already face an enormous number of struggles, including the fundamental problem of pay inequity, a pay inequity that is also driven according partly to race. And the fundamental issue is that we are not providing the ability, the broader ability, for people to make progress. We have abandoned the poor and we are abandoning the middle class. And this kind of thing that somehow assumes that the problem is that people are lazy when they're in the middle of poverty. That's not true. It is one of the hardest things you can possibly do to raise children, to try to get a job, to um, get transportation, to find housing. I mean, if you have a minimum wage job, and we, uh, we have someone who went through this, a minimum wage job at $11 an hour, you make $1,600 a month, and uh, the average apartment, single bedroom apartment in, in Somerville is $2,300. The problem is wages, and the problem is that uh, inability to gain access to wealth. We'll talk about that more in a minute. I, I agree with a lot of what my colleagues said. You know, I think one of the most fundamental ways that we should be judged is how we collectively, through government, treat those who are most vulnerable among us. And these proposals by our president, in my view, are inconsistent with who we are and are based on this false premise and caricature that he and the Republican Party too often promote, which is that people actually choose to just live large off their food stamps. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. Give me a break. Nobody chooses that. Nobody chooses that. And while people are in the, the hard times that Bob eloquently described, we need to be there for them, just as we would want them to be there for us if we were in that situation. So um, I completely disagree with it. Uh, you know, I don't know how Governor Baker stands on this stuff, but you can count on the fact that based on what these gentlemen said and, and how I feel, you elect one of us governor, you'll have a governor that is actually going to care about the most vulnerable among us. So this is a question for all three candidates. Um, in today's Boston Globe, it was reported that single-family home prices are higher um, this year. I think they're up 6.4% with the median single-family home price $340,000. Um, at $15 an hour minimum wage, you know, translating to $30,000 a year, that does not sound at all affordable. What are your thoughts about affordable rental housing and affordable um, housing uh, for, to, to promote home ownership in Massachusetts? Me? Yeah. Okay. Well, the biggest problem with affordable housing is the assumption that the market can solve this by itself. Markets build expensive housing for rich people. And so you have to have the government step in in order to uh, take clear, whether it is uh, tax incentive steps or regulatory steps or zoning st uh, steps that allow for other forms of housing to emerge. So it's partly a question of supply. We do need more housing. But we also need people to have more money so they can pay for housing. We also need to have different forms of ownership and of financing. So for example, if we, as has been done in Western Massachusetts, if we build uh, land trusts so that people don't have to own the land, but they can own the building, that can be an effective way of lowering housing. I also think that we need to uh, look uh, again at controlling uh, rent. I mean, we need to uh, discuss whether we're just gonna have rent soar until, I mean, in, in my area, I live in Somerville for the last 35 years. I've seen so many people, be, my neighbors, the, the parents of my uh, kids' uh, friends, uh, be priced out, be forced out. Young people, all right, I get the red, uh, red thing. Um, there's a lot we can do. It takes political will. It's been solved in other parts of the world. We can do it here. Uh, Jennifer's right. This is a crisis across the state. And I think the median home price is now actually close to $400,000 yep. in Massachusetts. This is a crisis. There are two big things that I think are starting to drag Massachusetts backwards. One is our transportation system, and the other is our affordable housing crisis. 
Our economy is dependent on the fact that the workforce can afford to live uh, near where they work. And we don't have that right now. I would um, uh, support, first of all, I'd exercise basic leadership skills in this area, which our governor hasn't. Acknowledge there's a problem, understand the scope of the problem, determine what the goal needs to be in terms of additional affordable housing supply, and execute against the plan. He's not doing any of that. I would do that. I would uh, engage in and support zoning reform that is going to ensure we balance community interests against the need for additional housing from low income to workforce housing, but that actually results in additional housing. And not just in Boston and Somerville and Cambridge, but in all the places we need it. Uh, work to better coordinate all the different affordable housing subsidies that exist in all these different state agencies to actually um, coordinate them and against the one common plan that we're working towards and provide basic leadership here, treat it like the crisis it is, and act with a sense of urgency to, uh, to address it. As the mayor of a city where it's very difficult to build affordable housing in Newton, um, I, here's what I know. Um, we can't allow developers to drive the process. Uh, because that was what was happening in my hometown for many years until I created a housing strategy uh, to create places where we could build housing and change some of the zoning laws where you could build certain types of apartments by right. Same thing needs to be said um, at the statewide level. Three things I think that are important. Number one, we need, to, we need zoning reform so that, we, that every city and town is designating areas for multifamily housing. We allow for accessory apartments by right in addition to that. And we also make it legal to require developers to build a certain amount of affordable housing. Second, we need to subsidize housing, folks. And it's not going to happen if we're just changing zoning laws. CDBG funds at the federal level have been cut. Community development block grants have been cut at the federal level. Home uh, funding has been cut. It's going to be up to the state of Massachusetts to fund and subsidize affordability. And three, I never talk about housing unless I connect transportation and good paying jobs as well. I would have my secretariats of MassDOT and economic uh, development and housing on the ground creating regional plans with real investment behind it. There's another crisis, uh, opioids that continue to take lives across the country and in Massachusetts. What specific measures would be top priorities for you as governor in addressing the opioid epidemic? So I have many specific measures, all of which you'll be able to read tomorrow when we release our plan for addressing this. But a few examples. Um, we absolutely need to invest more in the treatment resources across this state, which are not sufficient to meet the demand for this crisis, which is ruining people's lives and tearing families and communities apart across this entire state. This is a crisis. I also think we've got to stop treating people who are addicted like criminals and doing what Charlie Baker's doing and literally locking some of them up. I would end that. I think we've got to try bold new solutions like safe injection sites. It's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to help treat people and get them healthy if they don't stay alive. Um, I'm, I actually have experience working in this area. When I was CEO of my health insurance company that covered low-income people in the Medicaid program, the number one health condition of our members was addiction, of any health condition. We tried all kinds of new things. We lifted all prior authorization requirements to make it as easy as possible for people to get access to the treatment they needed. We paid for providers on the ground to go out in communities and find our members to get them engaged in the treatment they needed. We tried all kinds of different things. The Boston Globe named my company one of 46 game-changing companies in Massachusetts because of our innovative work in addressing the opioid crisis. I would take the same approach as governor. So as a mayor, um, I saw in my own community people living with addiction, people who've lost people of addiction. Uh, we put measures in place to try to access people, uh, give people access to treatment. As a gubernatorial candidate, I've been to over 170 communities. There hasn't been one time where someone has come up to me and said, I know, I know someone, I've lost someone. This is a centerpiece of my campaign, to shine a light on this epidemic. I've done nine, a series of nine town halls, 
and uh, listening sessions, roundtables around this issue, including one in Amherst. And here's what I'm hearing from people. I'm hearing from a doctor who said, who stood up at one of these town halls and said, uh, in New Bedford and said, this is an epidemic, we're not treating it as an epidemic. I'm hearing we need more clinicians, more beds for detox, longer stays. I'm hearing we need lifelong community-based wraparound services and treatment for people. And I'm hearing we need training for our doctors, many of whom don't have training on how to uh, treat people with addiction. This is gonna cost money. Right now, it's at a cost, this, this crisis, this epidemic is at a cost of $10 billion annually to the Commonwealth in criminal justice costs and healthcare costs. We've gotta invest more in treating people living with addiction, and we gotta do it now. It's very hard to answer a complex question in 60 seconds, but let me uh, try to enumerate the pieces of the problem or which we need to attack. So number one, uh, a good thing was that the, I believe it was the right thing for doctors to increase a pain treatment. As somebody who lived with a very painful in illness at a time when treatment was denied, I was very pleased when they made that. But the people who then corrupted it were the pharmaceutical companies that promoted these drugs. They should be sued. The money for, that we gained from those lawsuits should be put toward treatment, and we should proceed with an, an aggressive lowering of that. It's also a law enforcement problem uh, in stopping fentanyl, which is created often in China, and sent here. It is, as you've heard, a treatment problem. Um, I also, and I think I was the first person to support safe in injection sites, and the failure of this governor to respond with the level of treatment is critical. There's also a core element of economic despair. Many of our young people, people in low-income communities, do not believe they have a future, and so they are falling into uh, drug and uh, uh, addiction. And the final thing I want to say is this, in some ways, is not a new problem. Communities of color have been dealing with addiction for a very long time. And it is a good thing that we are now paying attention, but we should not pretend that this is a new problem except in its uh, dimension. So all of these pieces have to be fit together and worked on in a coordinated system, which I do have a plan for doing. What proposals do you have for criminal justice reform? Uh, more specifically, how would you eliminate the incarceration pipeline? Well, we're in a wonderful time in the sense that we have finally moved from a punitive model, which is where America was 10, 15, or 20 years ago, to a recognition that these uh, criminal justice is fundamentally broken. There has been a, uh, that we, we face the, uh, the shame of continued mass incarceration of people who should not, uh, who have, uh, have been uh, put in jail because of things that should not be criminalized. We need to end the school to jail pipeline, which is also a function of racism. We need, to, um, we need to move forward on all the aspects of the uh, a bill that was just passed out of conference, which include a reduction or elimination of, um, uh, of solitary confinement that improves services for people at every step, before people are arrested, when they're arrested, when they're in jail, and as they get out. We need to have improvements that allow well, us to lower at each step the number of people who are brought into our criminal justice system. So I support was originally the Senate says, uh, thing, but the key thing is you need a governor who is fundamentally committed to implementing these. It's not enough to pass a bill. Let's give it to Sadie. Sorry. Fine with me. All right. That's fine. All right. Look, we need um, more court diversion diverting people away from the criminal justice system that actually need mental health treatment, substance abuse treatment. We need to make sure that's embedded in our courts. If people are in fact incarcerated, we need to make sure they're getting ready for reentry. That means getting rid of solitary confinement. That means investing in mental health and substance abuse issues. And then when people do get and re-enter and connecting people with their families, and then when people do re-enter, we need to make sure they're connected to services and not just a parole officer. They need the basics, transportation, housing, social services, so that there isn't recidivism. We need to invest in all these things across the board. What we cannot do, afford to do, is to do something that Charlie Baker just recently did, 
submitted a mandatory minimum bill for nonviolent drug offenders in August. We need to get rid of mandatory minimums for this so that we can get people diverted out of our criminal justice system and into treatment. So uh, criminal justice, and, and I would also say, you know, we have all of these fees attached uh, to the criminal justice system that we need to get rid of, including parole fees and other types of fees that keep people within the criminal justice system when they should be, uh, have an opportunity to, to pivot out of it. I think this is the biggest civil rights issue of our time. Our criminal justice system is um, the among the best examples of where we still have institutional racism, where we have huge disparities in how our system treats people of color versus others. Uh, months ago, I put out a whole series of very ambitious reforms for our criminal justice system. I encourage you all to go to my website where you can read every single one of them. But they include fundamentally investing much less in put, putting people in jail for way too long and much more in the underlying causes of crime, like mental illness treatment, addiction treatment, and others. More diversionary programs, more programming for people who are in jail so they're successful when they get out and don't end up back in. Uh, I think we've got to reform our system in fees and fines. I think we should get rid of cash bail. I think we should eliminate all mandatory minimums except for murder and let judges do their jobs. I think we should um, increase the age for those who are uh, dealt with in the juvenile justice system to 21. There's legislation, legislation that is about to be passed by the legislature where they've done a lot of good work to make a big step forward in reforming our criminal justice system. It is a step. It isn't going to in my view, make a material difference in really reducing this uh, incarceration pipeline and mass incarceration problem and institutional racism problem. I think we need to go further, and as governor, this will be a priority of mine. This is a question about food insecurity. About what? Uh, food insecurity. Mm -hmm. According to the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, there are 200 25,000 people in this region who don't know where their next meal is coming from. What are your plans to address this particular problem? One of the things um, that we did um, in Newton when I was the mayor, um, we discovered the high level of food insecurity um, in the first four years of my term. What I did was I centralized and gave an opportunity for the largest food pantry in Newton. We re renovated, re renovated City Hall, the basement of it, so that that is where people could avail themselves uh, food weekly, and, and we increased the amount of people that were access, that had access to it, um, and they took advantage of it. When I think about this question, there are a lot of different ways. We know um, there's the development of, of farming here in the state of Massachusetts that's growing. Uh, we also know that government has a role to play in providing people with, uh, with food. I was here recently in Western Mass um, at one of the food pantries that is doing just that at a one-stop center where people get, get services. So what would I do? Um, I would look at uh, similar models, what I did in Newton, to expand access uh, to food uh, that's affordable. I'd make sure that we invest in making those places accessible uh, because transportation is an issue, particularly in Western Mass. And I'd work with for farmers um, here in this part of the state to do that. So this is, this is a tragic problem, and I, I think I read somewhere that one in seven children in Massachusetts are living in food insecure homes. This isn't a problem about our having enough food. We have enough food. The problem is there are too many families who are living in poverty and can't afford it. So first and foremost, we need to increase wages for people who, many of whom are working hard and are food insecure. Uh, which is why I support the 
uh, raise up agenda on raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour and having it indexed to inflation after that so that we don't need to worry about going back to the legislature every so often to raise the minimum wage again when it's not enough to support uh, basic needs that people have like food. Um, the other thing, one, one other thing I've learned recently is that there's actually a federal program that provides significant federal funding for breakfast for kids in school who, are, uh, who qualify from an income perspective that Massachusetts is not fully taking advantage of. This isn't even our Massachusetts money. This is federal money that is available for us to get to feed kids so they aren't hungry in school. We should absolutely do that, and, and I would make sure we do. So this is an example of an integrated problem. So I agree with Jay. If people had better wages, if we, uh, if we were not only increase the minimum wage, but increase wage, uh, wages across the board, people would have more money. But one of the things that has been so interesting for me being here in Western Mass is understanding the farming economy and understanding just how much money uh, goes into retail and advertising. It's more than 80 cents on the dollar. In fact, I think the farmer actually only gets something like 11 sense. So whatever we can do to boost local farming, as we are trying to do, it's an, uh, it is a difficult thing. But the reason I was flipping through my notes here is I just came from a farm not far from here, an organic farm, and learning about this federal program that's about to end that was an extension of the SNAP program, and I can't remember the name of it because I couldn't find it in my notes. But Thank you. So this is, a, this is, on the one hand, a wonderful idea to put organic food uh, directly in the hands, in many cases for free, and something that is being cut. So uh, this, as I say, integrated problem. We need to boost farming, increase access to local food. I used to run something called the New Economy Coalition, which was about strengthening local economies, particularly the food economy. And we need to pursue food justice, which is a whole category in itself, where we understand the relationship between poverty and uh, and malnutrition and so forth. Th this is a shocking problem, and uh, and I believe fundamentally. All right, I've run out of time. I believe fundamentally that if we believe in human rights, we have to uh, address food insecurity immediately. So I have a question for all three candidates on hiring practices. Um, should you become our next governor and you need to hire and appoint folks, um, who will guide you in your transition to make sure you draw upon a diverse group and you're inclusive? We have a previous governor who um, at one point had um, binders full of women. Um, do you have, uh, perhaps for another election, but at any rate, do you have a more sophisticated um, less condescending method for being inclusive. I have no binders. <laughs> no binders. Um, it's a really important question, though, because, look, we, we all would be great governors, I'm sure. But to deliver on an ambitious agenda like we all want to do, we can't do it alone. We need great people, other leaders in government who are going to manage uh, moving us forward in a lot of these areas. Um, one of the things I've learned in my various leadership roles in state government and the private sector is uh, everything is dependent on the team you build. And uh, I have a great deal of respect for the state workforce. I am committed as governor and I've made uh, this commitment that I would appoint a diverse, uh, well-qualified leadership team, women in leadership positions across state government, people of color, in, in leadership positions across state government. Uh, state government under my administration would lead by example in this regard. I have also said uh, that I would ensure that any business uh, doing business with state government, any vendor from state government, I would require them to ensure that at least 30% of their uh, board of directors is composed of women and minorities. We need to get our business community and leaders in other sectors to finally stand up and do the right thing and start providing opportunities for, for those who've been shut out.
So I find it truly depressing to think about the many hundreds of years in which wonderfully qualified people, brilliant people who happened to be women or people of color were denied leadership opportunities. And I think that even though I'm a white man, um, that's something that I carry with me. I've done a lot of international work. I have seen the incredible power of inclusion when you bring all different kinds of people around the table. Before I mentioned uh, that I was running, I was at UMass Boston, which is an extremely diverse uh, school. I had extraordinary students. So the, 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 the certainty that I carry with me is that there are people who are often overlooked. You have to go that extra mile. And I had the great privilege of working with all different kinds of community organizations organizations and others and built deep friendships because a lot of the hiring practices are partly if you are just only turned to the people you know. We saw this in the uh, Baker administration when uh, one of his uh, but, uh, secretaries uh, was simply hiring people who lived around him out in Wellesley, I think it was. So a commitment to diversity from the beginning as a structural component of uh, hiring is something that's absolutely built into who I am and I would make certain that was part of my administration. Yes, I'd make sure uh, my uh, appointments were diverse as far as race, background, gender. Um, also geography, I will have Western Massachusetts representation um, as well in leadership. But I also want to say something about public servants and unions. Unions are good. And I want to make it clear, you know, I'm, I, being a mayor for eight years, I did two rounds of negotiations with 17 unions in my city. They were fair. They were clear, we protected their health benefits and their pay, and we were sustainable. I did not try to put my uh, employees into the GIC because I knew what was gonna happen, what happened. And that is what Charlie Baker did in the dark of the night trying to move uh, state employees off their plans um, outside of the GI, um, in the GIC, it was wrong. We've gotta respect unions, we've gotta respect public employees. Charlie Baker sees the employees as numbers on a spreadsheet. I see them as public servants doing the work of the people. And I want to make it clear that's the kind of governor I would be. So our panelists have asked all their questions. I just want to let you know that we got, I think, 38 questions from the public. Not all of them. We're not going to be able to ask them all. I think we might have time for two or three more questions. <laughs> and then all of these folks get to have a, a closing statement. So I'm going to ask a question. So I started campaigning about a year ago, and one of the first things that I heard was uh, we're being ignored by Eastern Massachusetts and by the State House, and I thought, wow, that's, that sounds like a real problem. A year later, I have realized the depth of this problem, the degree to which regional injustice has been a a characteristic of Massachusetts for a long time. Now, for me, one of the key things is not only paying attention, not only ensuring that, uh, uh, that uh, the, the resources are there, but also the fundamental question of infrastructure and connectivity. So the failure, which I have to say continues to amaze me, to address the question of internet broadband, I mean, which is fundamental. <laughs> The, some of you may remember I came out to Northampton about a year ago and I asked very innocently, I asked the group, is this still a problem in, Mass in Western Mass? And I got 70 people going, yes! <laughs> And also the problem of transportation, these fundamental structural questions. Now, 
again, I've tried to point out, I have a structural view of systems. How do you boost things? It's not any one thing. It's integrating across uh, all of the things. So I would be the governor of one commonwealth. And to demonstrate that commitment, I have said that I will move the governor's office two days a month to some other part of the state, some overlooked, forgotten, uh, uh, a community that is thinks that no one pays attention to them. And we would bring the office out here and we would meet with people, but even more important, we would get people who've never been out here to come and meet with me out here. And that's something I think that's absolutely fundamental. So uh, I have learned a lot and I understand now and I consider it a special responsibility to, uh, to work with all uh, forgotten and overlooked communities, but Western Massachusetts is one of the worst uh, offended against uh, areas in the state. Yes, we need to uh, invest in expansion of public education. Yes, we need to invest in infrastructure, transportation, broadband. But we also need to invest in growing small and mid-sized uh, businesses that exist that want to scale up. Uh, we've got to provide uh, microloans and grants um, and technical assistance for sole proprietors and businesses that have the capacity to scale up and that want to scale up to create higher paying jobs where people live. I would also say, when these proposals like Amazon come along, we should not do what Governor Baker did. 26 communities applied for Amazon's second headquarters in the state of Massachusetts, all trying to give away as much tax exemption money as they could. Charlie Baker's answer was, go for it, God bless him. Go for it, God bless him is not an economic development strategy. My proposal was to have Amazon come to Worcester and have Amazon help us build East-West Rail, which we need to do anyway. This would provide higher paying jobs in the western part of the, more accessible to the western part of the state. It would also provide the transportation uh, for people to get to uh, Worcester in a lot easier way and grow the economy in an area that we need to, as opposed to go for it, God bless him, and God bless Marty Walsh, but he doesn't need Amazon in Boston. Um, so I think uh, we, we need to invest in, in our companies here. Um, and by the way, Governor Baker gave away $120 million to GE so that they could come to the Seaport District. How about taking some of that money and investing it in the companies that want to grow here in Western Massachusetts, right? So that we can scale those up. This, this is, these are the types of decisions that need to change, and they would if I were gov the governor. Western Massachusetts has been screwed for way too long by state government uh, from just the allocation of resources and attention. Um, you've gotten the short end of the stick, and it's not okay. Uh, I worked with Governor Patrick. He was intentional about trying to be the governor of the whole state, and he would make sure that we were too. Those in his administration, we'd come out here for cabinet meetings. Um, when I uh, was working with him, we made lots of investments finally in transportation infrastructure out here and roads and bridges through the accelerated bridge program that had been neglected for decades in our higher education institutions where we made investments. I was at UMass Amherst uh, a couple of times for a couple of big projects we, we invested in there and at the community colleges and state universities, every single one of them that had been neglected for decades. As your governor, I know that we, state government, have a special responsibility to Western Massachusetts, and we have some uh, makeup to do uh, from the decades of neglect. Uh, transportation infrastructure investment, economic development investments, mostly working in partnership with you, your local officials here, your business leaders here, to develop a common economic development strategy, assess what the true needs are here, uh, and all row in the same direction in partnership and collaboration, delivering on what you need to continue to grow and be successful in this region. And uh, you can count on the fact as your governor that I will be that partner. first, but I want to mention that a 
Somebody will tell me. It's funny because I was a daycare teacher for many years, and all I did was make people take turns, and evidently I had forgotten how to do that. Uh, uh, but economists have identified high quality, affordable early edu education as care to, to critical to our future. Um, business groups have identified the lack of it as an impediment to filling jobs. What are your two or three ideas to help solve this problem? Can I go first? <laughs> you say yes. Uh, this is my top priority as a candidate for governor. Um, I believe that I've committed by the end of my first term, every single child and family in this state will have access to high quality, affordable child care and preschool from birth to age five. It's not going to do, it's not going to do a lot of good for, uh, a, a family to get paid family leave, which we all support for 16 weeks, and then have to quit their job because they can't afford childcare. We are the most expensive state in the country. Uh, there are too many families where a parent is choosing to leave their job, not because they're choosing to, but because they have to after they have a child because they can't afford childcare. And the evidence is clear on this. This is game changing for young kids, particularly lower income kids, if they have access to good quality childcare and preschool. So what will I do, I, I, as, as Claire knows, I had the privilege uh, on, at the end of the Patrick administration, he appointed me to be the chair of the State Board of Early Education and Care. I learned a lot about this issue. I became passionate about it. It is the thing we can do that can make the biggest return on investment for kids and families, and I will get this done. We have to. We have to for our children and for our families. As a school committee member um, in Newton, um, we had uh, Newton has second highest number of millionaires in the state, yet one in eight of our households live at or below the poverty level. The kids coming in to our Newton public schools uh, that did not have a quality opportunity in early childhood came in behind the kids that did, and that, therein started the achievement gap. I know how important this is. On average, it costs $19,000 to send a child to early childhood in Massachusetts, yet zero through three is the most important time for brain development. We've got to invest and expand in the programs uh, that are doing well here in the state to provide additional seats uh, for them. We've got to provide uh, the option publicly um, if that option does not exist here in the Commonwealth. And we also have to involve parents directly um, in the development of their child uh, so that the, the, the parent um, and not just the child is involved with uh, early childhood development. If we do not do this, we will continually have our children falling behind as they grow up. I commit to making this a part of public education. It must be a part of it, and we've got to ask people doing well to pay for it so we can make that investment. My stepfather uh, was a professor at MIT and one of the founders of Media Lab, and he was convinced, as I am, that we, we need to rethink school fundamentally. Uh, so that means that we rethink zero to three, we rethink pre-K all the way up, uh, K through 12, uh, higher education, each piece has fallen behind the changes that we need. Now, partly this is a question of funding, but partly it's answering the question, what kind of skills do we really want and need our children to have to face the 21st century and uh, global competition? And many of those skills are cooperation, innovation, creativity, the ability to collaborate. And that's not what we're teaching in our schools. Uh, we are using high stakes tests. We are trying to do a comprehensive assessment that's not comprehensive. Now, I think I'm the only one up here who has been a teacher. Um, I'm someone who believes that we need to be prepared for the future. In addition to all the funding questions, we need to have a uh, unify us in a discussion of where we want to be in 10 or 15 years. Right now, we are having part-time piecemeal conversations that do not address the core of the future of Massachusetts. And education uh, is absolutely at the heart of that. So another place where the governor can lead a statewide conversation and lead to new commitments and new expenditures. Yes, thank you. Thanks to all of you. Um, we're really at pretty close to time. So I have another question. I'm just going to put it out there as you're closing up. You may want to think about some of this. You don't have to answer it, it's not on the test, but um, 
But when, when your eight years or 12 years or however long you are governor is over, what do you want people to remember? So think about that as you answer this. And I think we have an order here. And of course you can totally ignore me, which a lot of people do, so that'd be all right. <laughs> so I think we're starting with you, Mr. Massey. Okay, I, uh, I'm really honored to be here. I'm excited about this race. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of things that we didn't get a chance. First of all, we didn't address a core problem, and this is, a, this is something that's happened over and over again, which is all the ways in which what we've been discussing affects women. Women have special problems, special challenges. Uh, they face economic challenges. Most of the minimum wage hike would affect women. Uh, we need to address women's medical questions, a child and maternal health, and reproductive rights. Uh, we we need to address domestic uh, violence and sexual harassment. Those are things that uh, are fundamental to a governor's responsibilities to, to make, make sure we make progress on that. Now I just want to say, we have seen so much energy. I was back on the Boston Common for the March for Life, and we, what we see, I realized I'd been there six or eight times in the last year. So there is a surge of energy. People are ready to go. And I believe that as someone who is the only one up here who's the member of a union, the only person who has uh, laid out very broad, bold vision in the future in the past and made it happen, I think that we are ready to move forward, I would ask you to consider what is it that you most want to see, because that is what we could achieve if we come together and win this race. So I ask for your support. I ask you, to, I may look like a retired investment banker, but I, my heart <laughs> burns with the desire for justice, economic justice, racial justice, regional justice, gender justice, and I think that's the kind of governor we are ready for, and I hope that's the kind of government governor that you want want, because I, if you elect me, that's what I will be. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for being here. What a great turnout, energetic crowd. You even clapped for us every now and then, so thank you for that. Um, as I mentioned early on, in response to uh, Stan's question, we can win this. We can win this, but we need your help. Because with that big democratic turnout we're gonna have, ultimately people need to be informed about the choice. The choice, remember, between the governor who maybe is nice and not crazy and is doing a terrible job on every issue versus someone who's also nice and not crazy and it desperately wants to make a meaningful difference in people's lives and stand up for every single person. And as long as people are informed about that choice, we will win. But we need your help. And as I said, these are both two great guys. If either one of them wins the nomination, I will support them 100%. But I'm asking for your support as the only candidate in this race that has leadership experience in state government getting big things done. I think I'm best positioned to take on Charlie Baker in the general election on what he is, his perceived strength as a great manager, which he's actually failed. He won't be able to get away with that with me. I'll be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and say, hey, when I was there managing the state budget during much tougher times, the Great Recession, we got the highest bond ratings in state history, and you screwed it up. He will not be able to hide from me on these issues. And we will hold him accountable and expose his failings. Single payer we didn't talk about. I have experience in the healthcare industry. I know the healthcare industry. We have to move to a single payer system. We have to do it thoughtfully. I will provide the leadership to get it done. We will make a big difference with your help. And to answer Claire's question, with your help, and if we win, which we will, I am 100% confident that we will not only take back the governor's office, not only aim high again and make Massachusetts a leader again, but we will be remembered, not me, us, for making a meaningful difference in people's lives. And that's what it's about, and I'm asking for your help to do it. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you this evening. Weren't those Parkland students remarkable? Here's when I think about what these students started and what their message is to us. Think about it. It was young people that changed their trajectory on civil rights in this country. It was young people 
that changed trajectory and said no to the Vietnam War. And here we are right now at a critical moment in our country, in our commonwealth. It is young people that are not accepting what politicians want them to accept around the status quo and gun violence. But we ought to not just support them on gun violence and what they're doing and not accepting the status quo there. We ought to also support them when they don't accept the status quo when it comes to people taking on crushing debt for college. We should also support them when politicians tell them to support the status quo when it comes to not addressing climate change. We ought to support them when they say we shouldn't accept the status quo when it comes to transportation in our state or opioid addiction. We can no longer afford to accept Charlie Baker's status quo when it comes to educating our children. We can no longer accept Charlie Baker's status quo and low, to, low expectations when it comes to transportation. We can no longer accept Charlie Baker's status quo when it comes to treating people with opioid addiction. We can do better. We must do better. We've got to ask people who are doing well to contribute more so we can invest those things, right? And that's what my campaign is all about, telling the truth about these tough, challenging issues. Now, if you don't support me, I want you to support me. Get on board with one of these two guys because they're great people. Get on board now because we got to start organizing right now so we can beat Charlie Baker in November, right? So if we do this, to answer Claire's question, for me, we can ensure that people make ends meet in this Commonwealth and their kids do better than they did. And that's why I got into this race, addressing economic inequality. We can do it, folks. Let's go out there and work hard. I'm ready to, ready to roll up my sleeves and do it with you. Thank you very much. I ask for your support in the race. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thanks to the candidates, and let's go out and win.